Hello and greetings to all of you. Uh, my name is Adele Halliday. I use she, her pronouns, and I serve as the anti-racism and equity lead staff at the National Office of the United Church of Canada. We are glad that you are here for this 40 days live event. Today, we will be exploring the unconscious biases of anti-Asian racism with Henry Xu. Um, and we'll get to Henry in just a moment. Um, but first, here's just a little background about the 40 days of engagement on anti-racism in case this is your first event. Um, so this live event is part of a 40-day program with daily written reflections, uh, except for Sundays. And each day's reflection op offers opportunities for learning, faith reflections, and ideas for actions. Um, all of the writings were, were written by a breadth and a diversity of people from across the United Church. And the reflections are posted on the United Church website one week at a time. In addition to the daily reflections, there are these 40 days live events. And these live events run each Tuesday and are being recorded so that they can view, be viewed at any time. There are also discounted anti-racism books that are available from the United Church bookstore each and every week. And this week's book of the week is called Jesus and the Marginalized, Jesus Christ for Koreans in the United Church of Canada. And um, it's available from the United Church Bookstore, and there are there's a discount code called 40 Days to receive a discount of 40, uh, sorry, of 20% of orders of two or more books up until the end of November. Um, so without further ado, I will move over to Henry. Um, Henry has a presentation to share that he will share with us, and you will be welcome to make comments at the end or add questions in the chat throughout the talk. Um, he's inviting us to wait until he finishes his presentation before we ask questions, and at that time we'll be invited to use the reactions icon to raise your virtual hand, and then we unmuted to ask your questions. So our featured speaker is Henry Xu, who will be talking about the unconscious biases of anti-Asian racism. And Henry is uh, uses he, him pronouns, and is a professor in Chinese Buddhist studies at Emmanuel College, of Victoria University and at the University of Toronto. His research interests include studies on Mahayana Buddhism in India, China, and Tibet. And some of his earlier research interests include contemporary Buddhist movements, Buddhist chaplaincy, Buddhism in Canada, and Western classical music. So let us give a warm welcome to Henry. Thank you very much, Adele, for your introduction and also your invitation uh, to allow me to participate in this event. Um, it's an honor to me, and it also provides me with the opportunity to reflect on my experience and thoughts on anti-Asian racism. So thank you very much. Uh, as you introduced me, uh, 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 the audience would know that my background is actually not in Christian studies, but in Buddhist studies. So, you know, I teach uh, at Emmanuel College, which is part of the Toronto School of Theology. Uh, I guess uh, uh, a phrase that I could use to describe myself is that I am the only Buddhist in town. Uh, and through my preparation for this talk, I also come to realize that there could be a Buddhist angle of um, understanding why we have these attitudes of racism against another people. Uh, but I'm not going to get into that today. Um, instead, let me start by some stories uh, of what I experienced. Um, in the last few years. Okay. So uh, uh, actually just a few weeks ago, I attended a lecture given by Dr. Grace Jisun Kim. I, I think many of you here uh, knows her. Uh, she was invited to speak at the University of St. Michael's College in Toronto on the invisibility of Asian North Americans. It was a wonderful lecture. And during her presentation, she mentioned several instances which she felt were racist against her Asian backgrounds. But uh, when she expressed her discomforts and concerns about those instances, she was repeatedly assured that 
those were not cases of discrimination or racism. What was intriguing to me was whether those were attempts to cover up discriminations, um, uh, you know, uh, anti-Asian kind of racism, or that those people were not even aware that their words or actions could be felt as harmful and offensive. And that leads me to the question, how convincing am I as a Canadian of Asian descent to suggest to you all here that the unconscious biases um, of anti-Asian racism exist? How convincing can I be? Uh, am I being oversensitive? Am I exaggerating the situation here? Okay, so that would be my question. But uh, let me share with you an actual experience of myself a couple of years ago. So uh, around two years ago, I was um, planning to move closer to where I am working now, you know, so closer to downtown Toronto. Uh, it was during the pandemic and scheduling for house visits was you know, very difficult at the time. So we actually looked for months. Um, and finally, we found a property that we liked and fit our budget. So we made an offer through our real estate agent. But at that time, if you still remember two years ago, uh, the housing market was crazy. And uh, we were told that there was another offer submitted. So it was like a bidding war and very common uh, 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 in the housing market at that time. To bid against just one other offer was considered lucky for us. So we went for it. Uh, the next morning, we were told that uh, we lost the bid. That was okay. Uh, but later we realized that the selling price of the house was actually lower than what we offered. It means that we bid for a higher price with the same conditions, like the closing dates, et cetera, as the other offer. But the owner of the property decided to sell it to someone at a lower price. It did not make any sense at all, of course. Our real estate agent was upset and reported the, the issue to his boss. Uh, who found out that later that the seller, the buyer, and their agent were all Caucasians. Uh, did that constitute a case of discrimination? Well, no, uh, not legally speaking, because by law, one can sell a property to anyone at any price. It doesn't have to be the highest bid. But it's highly, highly unusual to sell anything at a lower price when there is a higher offer. Is there an implicit bias against our Asian background in this case? Well, we cannot say for sure. Maybe there were other considerations we were not aware of. Maybe the seller did not intend for anything discriminatory either. So we, we're not sure. But uh, another example just happened in Toronto yesterday, as you know, it was our municipal election day, but it also fell right on Diwali, a religious and cultural festival celebrated by the Hindus, um, the James and the Sikhs. It was a disaster when there was an unprecedented number of election uh, uh, work, uh, election worker uh, resignations. Uh, more than 150, I was told, actually, in Brampton. And um, uh, what makes the situation even more um, um, bad was that uh, I learned that there was a letter sent to the Minister for Municipal Affairs beforehand, 
to ensure that these South Asian Canadians do not have to choose between their religious observances and their civic duties. But there was no response to the letter and no plans to amend the election date. It was heavily criticized. And I think it is an instance when the religious and cultural needs of minorities were unconsciously neglected, which can be interpreted as a form of systemic racism. A message to those who are of South Asian descent that their cultural values are not as important as others. We certainly cannot say that the election day was purposely scheduled on the Diwali to make it difficult for the South Asian Canadians. But then, would the election be scheduled on Thanksgiving or Easter Monday or Christmas? Well, absolutely not. But why the Diwali? Why the Diwali? It is an example of a form of unconscious bias that leads to unfair decision-making in favor of one group as compared to others. So unconscious biases are also, well, social stereotypes about certain groups of people that we form outside of our conscious awareness. In my article for 40 Days of Engagement Against Anti-Racism, I wrote that the tricky thing about unconscious biases is that we are not conscious of them. It is different from the vicious attacks and blatant racism that are intentional and violent in nature. Recent research has shown that 45% of Asian Americans experienced a variety of anti-Asian hate during the pandemic. In Canada too, the surge in anti-Asian hate crime has been significant, where the surge of acts of vandalism is believed to be related to a rise in, in discrimination and hate crimes against Asian Canadians as the COVID pandemic continues. Indeed, uh, in British Columbia on the West Coast, Vancouver, uh, said to be the most Asian city outside Asia, is now named by Bloomberg as, quote, the anti-Asian hate crime capital of North America. End quote. It is astonishing that in 2020, more, more anti-Asian hate crimes were reported to police in Vancouver than in the top 10 most popular, populous U.S. cities combined. So we are talking about a city of 700,000 people. Uh, Professor Xu Lan Cheng at the University of San, uh, San Francisco concluded that, quote, the notion that Asian Americans are foreigners and outsiders makes it easier for them to be seen as reasonable targets where people can direct frustration, anger, fear, and aggression, including the spate of xenophobia and anti-Asian violence we have seen during this pandemic." End quote. Such racist violence has caused Asian North Americans to speak out against the vicious attacks. And it has also led them to pay serious attention to less violent forms of discrimination, such as implicit bias and microaggression. Professor Daryl Wing Xu at Teachers College at Columbia University commented on this new awareness of anti-Asian racism, saying that, quote, it's almost as if the public just discovered that there is anti-Asian bias, discrimination, 
and hatred in this country. What's upsetting is that it took so much violence for people to take the, the, the discrimination seriously, end quote. Well, um, I have seen that unconscious bias has been used interchangeably with implicit bias. And that both terms are defined similarly as a form of bias that occurs unintentionally. So I've been looking on the internet, on various websites and uh, dictionaries, and I saw that both terms were understood very similarly, that even though uh, it's a form of bias that occurs unintentionally, they nevertheless affect judgments, decisions, and leads us to act on the basis of prejudice and stereotypes. But I suspect that there may be a difference between the two, between unconscious bias and implicit bias. As the word implicit, to me, you know, um, someone whose first language is not English, to me, uh, implicit suggests that something is implied, but not plainly expressed. So implicit bias would then carry the meaning that it is actually intended, just not explicitly expressed or stated. Whereas unconscious bias, on the other hand, seems to be completely unintentional. So that's my understanding. You know, it's not any formal definition of the two terms. But uh, I would like to make a difference between the two so that we can concentrate on our discussion of unconscious bias today. A word that I mentioned a few times today is stereotype. Unconscious bias and stereotypes are closely related. While bias refers to a tendency towards a particular perspective, Stereotypes are more like preconceived negative notions about the people. Uh, stereotypes are actually like um, caricatures in a way that they, the portrayals are not completely baseless. You can still recognize the person that the caricatures try to, to capture. Uh, nevertheless, everything has been uh, distorted, out of portion, and exaggerated. Okay, so this is also how stereotypes work about a certain people, about the Asians in general, about the Chinese, about the Japanese, etc. Oftentimes, uh, unconscious biases are formed on the basis of stereotypes. In addition to that, current events also shape our racial attitudes. When government officials in the United States started using stigmatizing language to describe uh, the coronavirus, it created an impact on unconscious bias against Asian Americans. As I, I don't need to repeat those uh, stigmatizing language, but you know that uh, the virus has been linked especially to the Chinese in various ways. What I want to explain here, however, uh, is that our unconscious bias against people gradually takes form through news reports. Uh, more precisely, how the news was reported. It also takes form through the movies that we watched, the books that we read, the music that we listened to, the friends we grew up with, the racial attitudes of our parents, and in recent times, the social media we are addicted to. So all of these shape the way we perceive a certain people. It shapes the kind of stereotypes that are playing in our own minds. Uh, we don't look at the people directly, we try to understand them through those preconceived stereotypes. 
It is an invisible force bombarding us 24-7. Such an invisible force is felt by everyone in a society. Without self-awareness and critical thinking, we can easily fall victim to believing the myths about the people we don't actually know and become racist ourselves. And so I think we have the tendency to cast a rather positive image of ourselves. We never, well, most of us, we never imagine ourselves to be racist. You know, we never imagine ourselves to have any biases against another people. But this is, you know, what the tricky part about unconscious biases is all about, you know, that we are not conscious of the influences that we are under and how those influences shape the way we understand other people. Quoting from the American Psychological Association, racism is structural, institutional, interpersonal, and internalized. Its effects range from daily interpersonal interactions shaped by race to race-based opportunities for good education, housing, employment, etc. It is reflected in disparities in, but not limited to health, wealth, income, justice, and voting. It also unfairly advantages individuals belonging to socially and politically dominant racial groups, end quote. So this is the definition that I found uh, from the American Psychological Association website, uh, which also means that our racist attitude, our unconscious biases are part of our psychology. You know, it's not just about knowledge. It, it's not just about uh, misinformation. It is something that shapes the way our mind, our psychology works. Okay, so uh, if you have any kind of hatred against another people, it's not the people, it's not you, it is how everything lumps onto you, everything that shapes that kind of hatred between the people. Um, every country has some form of racism. Canada included, of course. It doesn't have to be the white against everyone else, which is usually how we use the term. It can be Americans against Americans, Africans against Africans, the Blacks against the Blacks, the Asians against the Asians as well. And so uh, being racist doesn't mean that it has to be, you know, targeted towards you know, people of a different race. It could be people of the same uh, race, but perhaps speaking a different dialect as well. It could be people that uh, you intentionally or unintentionally, unintentionally see as different from you. What I want to point out is that unconscious bias against Asian is not only found among the white privileged sector of North American society, it can be coming from other minority groups. And what is seldom discussed is that it is also found within Asian communities as well. Okay? So between people from China and those from Hong Kong or from Taiwan, etc. It is the creation of the myth of model minority that adds fuel to the fire of this kind of racism. I mentioned that stereotypes usually refer to preconceived negative notions about the people. Model minority is actually also a form of stereotype, only that 
it is more in the direction of preconceived positive notions about the people. Mono minority is a myth constructed back in the 1960s to describe what was viewed as a superior minority group in the United States. The myth was used against African-Americans. In shaping the model minority, the historical linguistic and ethnic diversity of both Asian North Americans and African North Americans are all ignored. And that positions the, the Asian Americans as well-educated, hardworking, valuing education highly, obedient, submissive, and successful, successful in uh, assimilating into the American culture. In doing so, the simplistic views lead to racialized hostility, pitting the Blacks and Asians against one another. When these kinds of stereotypes enter our mainstream cultures and entertainment, movies, the TV shows, etc., cetera, we, we gradually internalize them as norms without questioning them, being completely unconscious and aware, and unaware of the presence of biases and racism. Biases then became hidden and systemic. So the point that I want to reiterate is that it's not only the white people or the black people who are under this form of unconscious bias against the Asian people. Uh, it is also not only the, the white people and the black people who have this preconceived notion about um, model minority you know, of the Asian, uh, of the Americans of Asian descent. Uh, Asians themselves or Asians ourselves would also pigeonhole, you know, into this kind of description, this kind of narrative, that somehow, you know, not only myself, but many of my friends, many of those who were of the same generation as me, who came to North America in our teenage, we also fell under the same spell. And I think back in those times, we believed that the only options for us to enter the university is uh, mathematics or computer science or economics, you know, subjects that deals with uh, science and math, but not anything that has to do with the humanities, you know, historical studies, uh, politics, language, those are not our, those are not um, areas that we are welcome to, you know, if you know what I mean. So it's a, a kind of sentiment that we share that there are certain tables that we just have no place to be at. Tables here, of course, is uh, symbolic of the kind of professions or positions in a society. So uh, back in the 1990s, you know, early 1990s, which I, I think to me, it wasn't too long ago, uh, just 30 years ago. Uh, back in those times, we as Asians were still heavily under this kind of um, myth about um, model minority. Viewed in this way, Asian North Americans are firmly rooted in the many cultural traits attributed to us by the model minority narrative, such as having a strong work ethic, uh, respecting authority, being quiet, submissive, hardworking, and shy. I don't know how many of these descriptions would 
apply on myself here. I, I'm afraid uh, many of them do. Uh, it's not a bad thing, but I think uh, what is important to notice here is that not all Asians are like me. So having this myth of model minority would simplify Asians, including, of course, um, Japanese, Koreans, Chinese, and the Indians, you know, Laotians, Cambodians, et cetera, et cetera. Such a diversity culture, you know, such a diversity uh, personalities of people within this uh, umbrella term Asians would be seen as the same and that we are all alike to one another, being submissive and obedient and shy and not outspoken and, and all that. Okay. Uh, and because of that, we are seen as good workers. So I talk about the positive kind of uh, stereotypes. So that's probably a good thing about these kind of stereotypes that we are seen as good workers. But the cons side of this is that we were never seen as bold and risk-taking leaders. Such racial stereotypes lead us to pigeonhole ourselves in positions that often require technical expertise only, but not in the position of leadership. And therefore, we seldom develop our strategic and leadership skills. The, consequence, the consequences can hinder the progress of careers of many Asian, of many Canadians and Americans of Asian descent. There is simply an assumption of our abilities about who we are, etc. So if the formation of unconscious biases is systemic, we would also need systemic effort to deal with this kind of biases. Um, in schools, education, of course, plays a very, very important role. Okay. Uh, education on equity, diversity, inclusivity, and non-discrimination are very, very important. Uh, as we learn about the Asian diversity, their unique identities and cultures through which we can challenge stereotypes. And only through which, only through knowing about this diversity, only through getting to know these people individually that we can um, uh, challenge the kind of stereotypes that we firmly believed in. But that alone is not enough to combat the incessant artificial construct of unconscious biases through various media and people around us. And so knowledge is one thing, but the fact that we are constantly exposing ourselves to various kinds of unconscious biases around us, that knowledge alone is not enough because we can easily uh, lose sight of this um, um, knowledge and then we would unconsciously, unintentionally have, you know, the preconceived notions, you know, uh, taking over in our mind. And so uh, companies need to diversify their leadership teams. You know, they need to do something practical. Uh, for example, with increased transparency okay, about the structure of the companies about you know the institutions about uh, workplaces in general, you know how many percentage of the employees are at the management or administration levels, um, etc. So we we need transparency around that. 
so that we can build management, uh, management programs to provide a strong training in management and communications to whoever aspired to take on a leadership position, rather than having a naive, simple assumptions that they would not be interested. They lack the skills, they are not interested, so they stay where they are. You know, rather than having this kind of uh, assumption, provide the opportunities for training for them and establish a kind of rotation programs uh, so as to dismantle the corporate class ceiling for the Asians, which has barred uh, the kind of glass ceiling which has barred Asian Americans from such opportunities for decades. I have read that uh, in some articles, uh, that kind of glass ceiling uh, is not even described as glass ceiling, but bamboo ceiling. Okay? So it's an absolutely unpenetrable, uh, uh, not able to break through a kind of ceiling for the Asians. Okay? And there are many reasons for that. It's not because of um, um, how Asians generally are, you know, lacking in abilities to lead or to manage, but because of the kinds of stereotypes that have been labeled on them. Okay. Um, I never imagined myself to be a professor at a university in North America. That wasn't in my dream. Um, just like many Asians, as I mentioned earlier, I pigeonholed myself into the kind of studies uh, that many of my friends would go into, such as computer and math. So the first program that I enrolled myself in at the University of Toronto was actually engineering. So I was in mechanical engineering for, I think, three years. And in my third year, I was forced to take a breath course requirement. And I randomly picked a course on Buddhist philosophy and that changed my whole life. It was an opportunity for me to think outside of the norms that I have limited, up, limited myself into. And um, back in those times, uh, in the early 90s, I remember that most of my professors were white and male. Okay, so that was the kind of image that what professors are like to me. So I never imagined myself to be in this um, position, but I'm also very, great, uh, very grateful, very glad that uh, my professors, all of them, did not cast the kind of stereotypes on me, you know, that they never had doubts about my ability to conduct research uh, in the humanities, in the history, in the formation, in the philosophical understanding of Buddhism. Without that doubt, I could progress, you know, as a student, as an undergraduate student, as a graduate student, uh, you know, uh, in my studies. Okay? But as you can see from my example here, that opportunity was golden. It was very, very important. Um, and that opportunity only comes when our mind is freed from unconscious biases of any sort about a person, about a people. Okay? So uh, I think that's all that I want to share today. We still have 20 minutes left and I am happy to take any comments and questions from, from all of you. Thank you very much. Wonderful, thank you, Henry. Um, so if there are questions, uh, if you could please use the reactions button to raise your virtual hand uh, or feel free to type your questions in the chat and Henry will respond.
comment <coughs> comments are also welcome. It doesn't have to be questions. So there's one comment that was noted in the chat a little bit earlier, and it was just to okay. say that to add to the unconscious bias is accent biases, right. which right. adds to biases already there. Right, right, right. Yeah, very good. Uh, sorry, my eyes are not very good. Uh, I, I think I'm waiting for a surgery within two years or so. I have an early onset of um, uh, cataract. So I'm sorry if I was not able to catch the, uh, the message earlier. But uh, you are quite right. Uh, accent is something that I struggle on a daily basis. Uh, as you can tell, uh, my accent could be switching from a more American one to uh, a more British one to a more, you know, Chinese one. It's not stable. It's not consistent. You know, partly because of where I grew up. I, you know, I was born and raised in Hong Kong at a time when Hong Kong was still under the British colonial rule. So for many years, the English that I learned was coming from the British side. But of course, I have my own Chinese accent. And then the years that I lived in, in Canada would pick up some you know, Canadian or, or American kind of accent as well. But the way that I speak is not important. What is important is that I, well, I was quite conscious of the impact of my accent on the way people would receive, you know, my presentations. Okay. So it's not just about the contents, it's about the way that I deliver, you know, the, the message, the way that I speak. Uh, that I always felt that I was being judged by the way that I speak my English. I think I'm better these years um, uh, because um, in my workplace, there are you know, more and more uh, colleagues who are coming from different backgrounds and who speak English in very different ways, in different accents. And they were all equally accepted. So I, I'm more comfortable to express myself, you know, without having this burden on me, this constant uh, pressure on myself to speak English in a certain way. Uh, but thank you for the comment. That's very, very true. Uh, it's something that probably those of you who whose English is your first language may not even imagine. <laughs> I, I saw uh, Noel. Uh, did you want to say something? Yes. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Henry, for for many things that uh, you mentioned monoculture and about racism within. Um, I don't know if uh, this would further complicate it because mm -hmm. as a Filipino, we we ha we are a, a group of islands, seven thousand one hundred islands, depending on the time. Mm -hmm in the Philippines, and we are very regionalistic. Mm -hmm. To add on to that is that if you're not from Manila or the center periphery thing, you know, you come from other provinces, the accent bias comes yeah. into play and then you begin to, to, to be sort of, you know, put in a cut category or something right. like Categorized, that. Categorized, yes. Uh, and this, you know, uh, this further sort of complicates uh, this issue of, of unconscious bias. Right. So whenever I hear a fellow, fellow Filipino say something, yes. I can instantly determine where or he, she comes from. Yes. Th yes. There's this something which is very unconscious, which mm -hmm. I'm very, very much aware of. Thank you. Thank you, Henry. Yeah, thank you. Know. Thank you, Noel, for, for uh, commenting on, on that. Well, I can say the same about the Chinese as well. Okay. So I mentioned that it could be, you know, there, there are differences between the mainland Chinese and the Chinese from Hong Kong and, and from Taiwan. But even those within mainland China, 
you know, would have all kinds of diversities. So those who speak with a, a Beijing accent versus those coming from the south, from the Guangdong uh, province, or those from Shanghai, they all speak Mandarin in different ways, and they would instantly be picked up where they, they came from. And the kind of assumption of the kind of people, the kind of person you are because of where you originally came from. That's very, very true. Yeah, thank you, Noel. Uh, let me try to read the comments here by Betty, further to the discussions. Rural seniors. Ask someone to repeat what they are saying when they are having difficulty understanding. Right, right. So um, unconscious bias against, well, uh, that are formed around um, ages, you know, about um, uh, how we um, address to elder people, you know, how age would become a factor in our way of understanding others. Um, and there is another one. Uh, religious beliefs are at the root of most prejudices and stereotypes. Since all religions are exclusive at their very core, even if outwardly they may appear to be all embracing, how could we, sorry, how could we approach this challenge, right? So uh, theory and practice, well, there is always a gap in between them. Um, I would I would say that most religions would embrace uh, equity, diversity, you know, that kind of positive things that we hold dearly in our hearts. But in practice, it's a very different thing. Um, I imagine that I, I was teaching a, a, a class on the mass conversion movement in India back in the 1950s. Uh, it was uh, an attempt to, to liberate the uh, uh, um, the untouchables people in India uh, by converting them to another religion. So the, the whole idea about the caste system and the untouchables were part of the religious belief of you know, back in those times, the Vedic uh, uh, religion and, you know, more in more recent times, Hinduism, you know, what we generally refer to as Hinduism. So how to liberate these people? Uh, Dr. M. Becker at the time had the idea that, you know, he could convert these untouchables to another religion, publicly declare that they are not part of the Hindu fold anymore, so that they should not be categorized as the untouchables anymore. Uh, and uh, Dr. M. Becker was uh, searching for the right religion, you know, to convert these people to. And one of the first was uh, Christianity. I, I, I believe it's not even one of the first, but the very first religion that he had in mind was Christianity because uh, Dr. M. Becker considered himself as a student of the Bible. So he admired the teachings of Jesus. He told these teachings to his heart and, and all that. But then uh, he gave up the idea of converting these people to Christianity because he observed that in actual practice, the Christian churches in India still observed the caste system. That when you go into the church, you will see that, you know, that the Christians were seated according to their caste status. You know, those who are of the lower class would have to be seated at the very back, you know, things like that. So, you know, uh, the comment is quite right that um, on the one hand, we have all these wonderful teachings, inspiring and, and all that. But in actual practice, our culture, our unconscious biases, uh, stereotypes and all that still kicks in and would um, uh, 
you know, uh, in a, a religious community, oftentimes we don't see a more liberating community than the actual world outside. So what can we do about that? What can we do about that? Uh, well, I think, um, well, it's very, very difficult. But I, I think uh, one of the things that we always kept, we always have to keep in mind is that uh, we should have this kind of self-awareness about the way we assume what other people are, to have the critical thinking about the information that we receive. Especially in these days, there are lots and lots of misinformation floating around. Uh, the algorithms on your social media will only reinforce your preconceived notions uh, because you will be fed with the same or similar kind of news and information uh, based on what you watched or read earlier. Okay? So the more that you immerse yourself into the social media, the more convinced you are that your view was correct. And, you know, so, so we have to break away from all this by way of crit critical thinking, by way of approaching people as people rather than, you know, shrouding ourselves within these um, stereotypes, you know, these preconceived notions. Those are very important, uh, whether you are practicing a religion or not. Yeah, so I, I don't know if I answered your question. Um, it's a very difficult question, but uh, I do see that there are roots of these uh, prejudices uh, and stereotypes in many religions. Jill, yes? Did I understand you correctly that you hmm. said you almost bought into your own stereotype until you were in third year university? Because I found that really interesting. That's correct. That's correct. So uh, uh, to tell you a bit more about my story, uh, I not only uh, uh, tried to break away from that kind of uh, preconceived notions of how a nation in North America should be like, but I also had to convince my parents mm -hmm. that this is the right direction for me to take on, which was not easy either because the parents, their generation would have their own unconscious biases about Asians in general. Um, my parents were also uh, raised and you know, lived in, in Hong Kong under the British colonial rule. Okay. So at the time, as you can imagine, the governor of Hong Kong, the high officials of Hong Kong were all British. So there was a, a preconceived idea that you know, those uh, privileged class of the people in Hong Kong were all Caucasians, foreigners, you know, British, white people, uh, and that most the majority of the Chinese living in the city, you know, would be hard workers, you know, following demands or, or um, uh, orders, you know. So that's the the kind of uh, preconceived notions in our mind. So. My parents, well, I, I would consider myself to be a good student back then, that my grades were good and, and all that. So my parents would think, you know, why not going into like engineering that can ensure a, a career in the future? You know, this is something that I, I was good at. So why not, you know, why wasting my, my, my uh, talents, you know, in that way? So it was difficult. You know, uh, what do I do with a degree in religious studies? <laughs> You've done a really good job of describing how insidious the, the unconscious right. bias is. So thank you. Thank you, Jill. Yes. Any other comments? Uh, did I miss? 
uh, some of there's, the messages in the chat. Uh, Adele, few, please, yeah. Sure, there's just a few messages in the chat. Yeah. If I can um, read read maybe mm -hmm. all of them, and you're welcome to choose what might work. Right. Um, so one is asking about is it um, is there a positive way to ask someone to repeat saying something um, if mm. the listener is having difficulty understanding, um, particularly around various English accents. That's one question. Mm -hmm. um, another question is around uh, what about the assumptions of what is normal? So, for example, today's presentation is engagement is in English. Would people come if the presentation was offered in a different language with interpretation? Mm -hmm. um, another comment, just um, noting uh, appreciation for um, the identification of unconscious biases. So offering thanks to you. Um, and another noting just how uh, how listening um, requires patience and effort. Uh, hmm. cross-cultural, intercultural understanding, right. and then um, some people sharing their own experiences that also resonates with what you were talking about. So mm -hmm. um, so the two questions in there, the one was around um, how how do you ask someone um, if you don't understand their, their accent? And again, this question around um, what is normal? Right. Uh, how do you ask someone if you don't understand their accent? Um, Um, well, I, I would say that there may not be um, a one size for all, you know, kind of um, uh, approach to this. You know, uh, there, there wouldn't be any one approach that would be perfect for all situations. It really depends on the person, depends on their age, depends on how much you could get out of their accents. So maybe a good way, you know, I'm just, you know, thinking at the top of my head here is that you try to repeat what you understand and to get the clarification from the person instead of asking, you know, what did you just say? You know, try to repeat, you know, or present what you understand from that conversation and to see if you got anything wrong. That would be my approach to this. Did that help? <laughs> uh, so uh, the other question was, sorry, about, uh, sorry, I lost myself here. So what, so what, so yes, what is normal? Yeah. So if, for example, mm. this presentation had been offered in a language other than English, and then there was an interpretation, um, mm -hmm. would that, um, engage people differently, would different people come? Um, mm -hmm. yeah. So what is what is normal? Well, I, I don't have the answer for that. What is normal? Uh, I presented in, in other languages as well. So I, I presented in Chinese, I well, in Cantonese and in Mandarin, uh, in other occasions. Um, um, I would say that my Mandarin is worse than my English. So I would oftentimes be asked, what did I really just say? Because of my heavy Cantonese accent of my Mandarin. But um, I, I don't think there is uh, anything that we should uh, consider as, as the absolute standard or normal. Okay? Uh, especially in Canada, we, we proud ourselves you know, as a, a multicultural city a multicultural country so uh, as long as you know you are able to engage your audience with the kind of language that they can easily understand and that your presentation it's something meaningful and useful to them I, I don't think English or French would be the only options that we consider normal here. It could be in an Indian language or in a, a, a Filipino, you know, a kind of a dialect that would serve the community well. And so um, I, I, I don't think, you know, uh, we should uh, limit ourselves to any kind of standards. I, I hope that I answered the question. Yes, thank you, Henry. Thank you, Adele. Um, are there some closing words that you would like to offer for the gathering? Um, 
Well, uh, again, I appreciate the opportunity to share my experience and understanding here. Um, I appreciate this opportunity because I did not take this as normal. I can imagine that uh, an opportunity like this will be extremely rare in other countries. Okay. Uh, so, you know, I am grateful for this opportunity and uh, the kind of environment, the kind of culture that we are in. Okay. And uh, the United Church of Canada, uh, which is organizing, you know, this important series to help us understand, you know, uh, the efforts towards anti-racism. Okay. So it's not just about the Asians, you know, it's all kinds of racism that we should be very careful, very concerned about. Uh, Diana, uh, do you have a question or a comment that you want to share with us? I do. Um, I do. Thank you very much for your uh, presentation. It helped me see the world in a little bit differently. Um, I have a question because I don't know how to handle this. Mm. I really try hard not to have biases, not to have racism. And I might have some and not know them, but I try really hard not to. So, mm -hmm. um, okay, I, I grew up in Vancouver, Canada. Yeah. I've been here 50 plus year. Mm -hmm. When I meet some, when I meet other um, Chinese from either China or Taiwan, mm. uh, they ask me where I'm from and I get very uncomfortable. Like I know it, I'm not feeling, it's a negative feeling, but I don't know how to express it and I don't know how to handle it. I mm. get la less ask of where I'm from, from the white folks, mm -hmm. but from my own kind, they want to know. And as soon as they ask it, and as soon as I repeat it, there's a, a silence mm. and it's very uncomfortable. I don't know, like, I think there was a, there's a bias going on. How mm. would you handle it? I want to continue going in society and meeting different people and learning. And to do right. that, I have to engage with others. And sometimes it's an uncomfortable feeling. Yes, yes, yeah. yes. So, uh, well, I think that um, um, the way that I talk about unconscious biases may mislead us to think that there could be an ideal that we can reach a stage when our mind is completely without biases mm -hmm. of any sort. But that's that won't be the case. You know, if yeah. uh, you are a, a Buddhist, you would think that, you know, only the enlightened ones would be able to do that. Or only yeah. Jesus will be able to do that, you know, if you're yeah. practicing Christianity. So we are ordinary sentient beings. You know, we have to accept that from time to time we have biases yeah. in our minds. What is important is that we are aware that mm -hmm. we have biases. That's the starting point. It's very important to have this awareness. And uh, at the same time, we should... Um, we should be prepared that other people would also have their own biases as well. Yes. And that we should be uh, compassionate about them because they may not be mm. aware of their own biases at all. So we are all, you know, in a way, we are all on the same boat that we are learning to become less biased uh, but some of us may be, you know, uh, going uh, further, you know, in this uh, uh, learning process. Some of them, mm -hmm. some of us may be more, you know, uh, left behind, but we are all learning towards this. So uh, if you are uncomfortable about those comments or questions, uh, try to um, uh, take them with, with compassion to mm -hmm. see where they came from that mm -hmm. you know that kind of biases may be harmful to you but in the long run that kind of thinking that kind of uh, um the kind of racist or, or biases that these people hold in their minds 
are also harming them. Yes. So uh, be be compassionate about them, and if you can try to to open them up a bit, you know, okay. through the way you present yourselves, you know, through how you you can lead them to to see things in a a, a different light. That yeah. would be the best that I I could do in such a situation, and that's the yeah. best advice that I could offer you here. Thank you very much. Thank I you, think. Thank you. I think the United Church is very progressive in offering this theory. Thank you. Thank you, Diana. Yeah. Thank you, Henry, once again. Um, so we are coming to the end of this session. Um, once again, are there any final words you might want to offer as we uh, move towards closing? Well, as I said, I am very grateful. Uh, uh, of this opportunity, I I think it is important, you know, that um, anti-racism is is not just a um, it should not be be seen as a a political issue only. Okay? Um, it's not just to be you know polit politically correct, you know, not to be racist, but it is also a spiritual issue as well. You know, how to behave, how to live, how to approach other people, how to experience our daily lives without racist stereotypes in our mind. That takes years of spiritual cultivation to achieve. So um, I, I don't want us to focus on anti-racism as uh, something that we can deal with, you know, only through uh, um, um, structural means. You know, uh, I think you know something that I, I did not really mention in my presentation is that it should also be part of our spiritual practice. So that would be my closing words. I hope you enjoy my presentation. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much, Henry. And uh, I'm quite sure people enjoyed the presentation because there were lots of reactions appearing, uh, the thumbs up, and people are writing into the chat saying thanks for your thank insights, you. um, for your reflections, for all that you've offered. So deep I, thanks. I'll take a look at all of them. Okay. <laughs> after the closing, yes. Thank yes, you. Excellent. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Well, and thank you again. Deep thanks and appreciation, Henry, for um, all that you offered today. And um, people are welcome to read Henry's reflection, his written reflection, as well on the on the unconscious biases of anti-Asian racism, which explores this topic as well in an even more expansive way. Um, we're coming to the end of this session, uh, and again, noting that this is one component of a much broader uh, program on the 40 Days of Engagement on Anti-Racism. So in case you're interested in reading additional written reflections, Henry's being one of them, um, they're all, they, they are available on the United Church's website one week at a time. There's a weekly newsletter that comes out that offers um, an overview of the week, uh, insights, and um, things that you can both look forward to. It, it promotes the upcoming events, gatherings, and uh, other things that are happening. So you're welcome to sign up for the newsletter if you'd like. Um, and then just to note that um, this week's book of the week is called uh, Jesus Christ, Jesus and the Marginalized Jesus Christ for Koreans in the United Church of Canada. Uh, mm -hmm. It's available on the United Church book, the United Church bookstore. And um, if you use a discount code 40 days, you'd receive a uh, discount of 20% of orders of two or more up until the end of November. So thank you everyone for being here uh, during this time, this discussion of the unconscious biases of anti-Asian racism. Um, we'll hope you will join us again for future 40 Days live events and find continued ways to engage with the 40 Days of Engagement on Anti-Racism. So thanks again to everyone for your participation. Thank you to Henry for his leadership and thank you for Brian for doing the tech uh, expertise in the background. Thank you again. Thank you.